one. And the Flex Zone is back. People to wreak havoc on your airwaves. The Flex Zone only sports shows. We get your sports how you want it, when you need it, just in case you was wondering who I was again. I hope you didn't forget. I'm the host, Mikel Ramos. Usual suspects in the house. Dre. What's good, everybody? This is Dre. Make sure y'all follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, Andre Melton. And keeping it steadily moving, another usual suspect, always in the same spot that I like him because it doesn't want, I don't want to mess up my feng shui. Hello. Crevante Heard here at Crevante Heard, at C-R-E-V-O-N-T-E-H-U-R-D-E, Facebook and Twitter, and Instagram is Crevante underscore Heard. And the only man that helps us all feel the power, hello. That's right, don't you dare be sour. All right. The Mars Atlas D on Facebook. Hey, folks, I got a Twitter finally. Oh, I'm wow. Twitter, and an Instagram. And, and the gram, too. The gram, but. <laughs> wow. On, on I, the, I found the, it very, it was very nice when my when my phone buzzed and <laughs> DeMarcus Analyst D had his first photo up. Mm-mm-mm. I know it was Dusty. No, I'm kidding. No, it wasn't Dusty. <laughs> wasn't Dusty. I was right. like, you made it. Yes, I have. Right. One honorable mention not in the house with yeah. us tonight. He on vacation. He on vacation. Light skin brothers need vacation too. Maybe we can put a light skin Stephen Curry right Byron. here. Right Byron. Side of Byron's not here, but we're going to do the show in your honor. Bro, see you next week and it's when you get back. If you have any questions, ideas, or possibly want to be a guest, send us an email to the on one at gmail.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Tonight's show, people, got a lot of news. A lot of sports news from around the league. And then we conclude with WWE. Let's move on, shall we? Stuart Scott. You all know who Stuart Scott is. Stuart Scott made broadcasting. People like me fall in love with broadcasting. Booyah. Booyah. Celebrated his birthday last week to be exact. July 19th. Would have been 51 years old. D, you said booyah. 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 Cool, cool side of the pillow, folks. I tell you, yeah, it, it, it's it was interesting seeing his birthday. He just had the speech right before he passed away at the ESPYS. It's just he had that impact, and it was just remember him. It's just fun to see. It's just fun to see, and hopefully, his kids. I, w- I would like to see his kids when they get in broadcasting. Kind of be kind of nice. Do you guys remember uh, Jimmy V's speech? Oh yes. I mean, they play it every year. I think That's Stuart a- Scott's um, speech is 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 pretty close to that one, and there's no other one that's really that close. And every time I think of Jimmy V, I instantly think of Stuart Scott because, well, for obvious reasons. Right. But I I almost feel the same when I, when Jimmy V when, when they show Jimmy V's old you know old, old shots, old photos, and um, video as I do with Stuart Scott, and I actually saw. You know what I'm saying? Stuart Scott growing up, like the other side of the pillow. As cool as the other side of the pillow is my favorite. That's one of my favorite lines. You know what I'm saying? We use that today. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, but, you know, it's it's still it's still hard. It still sucks because, you know what I'm saying, it was a cancer. You know what I'm saying? So, it, it, it's tough. It's it's tough to get over, but we 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 will get better as people. You don't die. You, you beat cancer. I mean, he 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 did. There was one time he did beat it, um, and we we thought that you know he was going to be able to actually come back, and then the the cancer um, came back and ultimately took him out. But I mean, this is a guy like Cravante was saying, who we grew up watching with classic catchphrases that I mean we we still use today, and he was able to make sports fun from an analytical ta- standpoint watching it. And then able to kind of mix some current hip hop with it. Um, I mean, you 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 hear phrases all the time in different uh, raps. I, I know I was listening to Lil Wayne, and he he made a reference to Stuart Scott on uh, the Carter Three album and the Three Peat. So his uh, his uncanny ability to be one of the fellas. You never. You never knew that even if you saw Stuart Scott in person, that he would not be the same Stuart Scott. His uncanny ability to show the heart in sports and relate it so fairly and so well to society and something that people don't like to pay attention to a lot. I mean, you see Craig Sager right now going through what he's going through also with cancer and leukemia and 
but, but two Stuart, different ways of attacking it. Yeah. Stewart at one point had to stop working. Right. Craig has continued. I mean, Craig's ha- going to the Olympics, right? Hasn't it been past the months? That it's they they they, had, they gave him six. Right. Yeah. 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 He's That's still true. he's still going. He's, he's still working. Like he's, he's still not working. even down. Right. He's, and he's, he's so, moving. <laughs> and he's so humble. Like Stewart, you would see him boxing and all types of stuff. Craig is just working. He still has his suits. He's humbly. Every time somebody tries to acknowledge what he's going through, he just humbly takes it. Right. He doesn't make a comment on it. But um, Stewart. Stewart. Dude, I would have been fifty one. The good die young. I always thought. Um, do you think he ran any of his uh ideas as and catchphrases and things of those that nature? Like when he make references to uh music, did he run those past the producer? I think he just said it. And I after think, a while, I think, he just after a while it stuck. I think, I think it was it flows so yeah. That's what I flowed too smooth to be rehearsed. You know what I'm saying? I just I just wonder if if and I, well obviously it was cool with it because he was on air forever. I think the first time he probably did, hey, cut, wait, huh, we don't know that. Oh, that. wait a minute now. Then oh. once it probably started getting some traction and yeah, he started becoming right. known for, Let him do, do it. whatever you want, bro. Let him do it. Do whatever you want. I, I can't believe, how many years has this been? Me too. What, what oh, since he passed? It's two, right? One. One. No, one. Yeah. It, was, it was January of uh, it was January 15. 15, yeah. Oh, okay. It's only been a year and a half. <laughs> I remember finding out Stuart Scott died, and I was on my way. No, not the fifteenth, right? The fifteenth? It was the fifteenth. What was that? I remember finding out Stuart Scott died, and I was on my way to New York to meet my mother for her birthday. And I remember turning on the TV. I remember bawling, and I remember trying to talk to people, and they could not understand why I was so upset. I cried as if I knew this man. The only person that understood was my father. <laughs> but I'm bawling, like, in real tears. Like, I could not believe it. It's it's terrible. It's unfortunate. Still miss that guy. Yeah, it hurt. It, it, it definitely it definitely hurt when um when we got the news because, like, wow, we talk about, like, we did know him in so many ways because we grew up watching him. Mm-hmm. And he was yeah. about what we were about. Broadcasting so will never be business. the same. It, it wasn't too many black people on yeah. ESPN at the time it either. Wasn't, it was, he was, he it was set pretty the much Mike Tirico and John Saunders. Really. Yeah, he, what he is, set the yeah. standard. What is really. our duty as broadcasters on the come up to a guy like Stuart Scott and continuing his legacy? Make sure that we, we take <laughs> others with us and put others over. I mean, um, when you hear the stories at ESPN from other black journalists who were there, he was always encouraging um, and making sure that they were always on their game and he was always able to give advice and h- his thing was not to just put himself over but help put others over and get the next generation of journalists up and coming. So I, th- I think that's what ultimately I would take from Stuart is to, is to really put other people over. Got it. Uh, oh. Also, uh, yeah. one, more, one more thing I want to add. Um, let's keep Stuart alive. Let's keep talking about it. Let's keep reminding people of what he was because the kids coming up now don't really know Stuart Scott. Yeah, they and they're not going to know, you know what I'm saying, the, the, more, the, more, the more the years go by. So just keeping him alive as broadcasters. Mm. Rest in peace, Stuart Scott. Still the coolest man on the other side mm-hmm. of the pillow. One time for the good time. Booyah. 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 Moving on to some other, oh, man. Some other news in the, in, in the NFL land. From a broadcaster to an actual coach, Dennis Green, the great Dennis Green, dies at the age of 67 to cardiac arrest. Where unknown, Dennis Green, famous, big, infamous coach, took over as the coach of the Vikings in 1992. Green was the only was the only second black head coach in the modern era of the National Football League. Art Shell had become head coach of the Raiders in 1989. Unfortunately, he was not able to reach the Super Bowl. A couple of bad performances in the postseason led to that. But Dennis Green, legendary. Yes. We everyone knows the speech now. Crown is behind, as they would say. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you why he was mad that night in two thousand six. I'm looking at Edron James stats in that game. I would be mad too. He had thirty six carries for fifty five yards. I would be mad too. I mean I, I, when you think about you're, you're going to the running back, I'm going to the leader, the quarterback. Oh, Matt Liner yeah, stunk up stunk the joint up. that night. Well, hold on, hold and on. then he, then 
How he was 24 for 42, 232 yards, two, two TDs. But he, he had, what was it, turnovers? Like, it was either tu- I think he was, had two fumbles in it was, that game. It was during crucial moments, and then that helped the Bears – Win that that game, that comeback. And, the Bears came and, back and, and beat them. How, how do you lose to Rex Grossman on Monday Night Football? Uh, Listen, no, 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 wait, no, Rex wait, Grossman, wait, by the wait, way, wait. had four interceptions in that game. Wait, a, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, um, I've got to got to remind you guys of the, those Chicago Bears that they were playing. Arguably, was probably the best defense that year, was, and was, also they had number one special team as well because they had Devin yeah, Hester on yeah. that team. They so had, they had two two out of three. You could win games if two out of three is playing top notch, and you know what I'm saying one's playing mediocre to average. Uh, below but, average, and but in that case, below average. Can I believe how many interceptions four. did he have? He had four, and they overcame all that. On the That's road. how good that defense and that special team was. And of course, it was of course you have to when a when a meltdown like that happens, it's both sides. Right. But um, I, I remember the nail in the coffin with Devin Hester <laughs> made his made his return. I said, "Wow, this yeah. is happening." And when I, I just remember. Now, I mean, we're not taking away from the legacy because at this point, I mean, we're we're actually like kind of laughing about, about it because it. it was. But I mean, it was it was. It was it's, it. I mean, it's it's a soundbite that's used like Iverson's practice. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it was hey. kind of a funny moment. So who we but, talking I mean, about? But it's a classic moment though. It's classic, yeah. Because we'll I never remember, forget that. I remember that night, and you could just see him seething, and this is why I legitimately high. just say these these guys really need like. A, an hour, thirty minutes to an hour of just being able to cool off and before yep, they see, go up. Now there. we see why Cam didn't have nothing yeah, to say. Because I mean, you're 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 you're, you're so emotionally attached to what just happened. You don't have time to process, cool down, and he just gets on that podium and he, he, he lets it mic, all out. And he's Ooh, like, he let and it he all that's out. Why we lost oh, the game. Man, they, my my favorite though was they are who we thought they were. Well, we and, then, the and then when they had the uh, Bud Light commercial, I think it was the Bud Budweiser commercial. Yeah. <laughs> oh, why and they then, with and, and then I think it was Coors going, Light. It was Coors Light, Dre. Oh, it was Coors Light, yeah. and they kept going back and forth with like they are who we thought hey. they were. And he's like the, and the guy's you, like who who are they? <laughs> like you got that right. Rant- what 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 does it go as far as rants? The ranking of the rants. Oh, you got that rant. Oh my boy. You got Jim Moore. You got Jim Moore. Pra- playoffs. Jim nah. Moore, boy. Oh, he was the gosh. king of rants. You got playoffs. It, it, it's up there. It's definitely up there because I, especially as far as coaching rants, yeah, right. it's got to be number two behind. It's, yeah. it's got to be number two yeah. behind playoffs. Like cause that's all time right. playoffs. And every time playoffs, <laughs> it's, every time really? playoffs start, they got to show. They got to sound. They so got to do that. Your boy sometimes, looked to your left and to his right and was like, "Playoffs, playoffs." Oh, we won a game. Sometimes <laughs> I mean, sometimes I may even put the Dennis the Dennis Green one ahead of that just to, for me for my personal let's, because let's, let's, I, I thought both. it was fun. Let's settle both. down a little bit. Had a couple laughs, but Dennis Green. Another coach gone. Another minority coach gone. Dennis Green, one of, like I said, second half black pioneer. coaches, pioneers of this modern era. And we talk about modern era. We talk about in this era. I mean, he was one hell of a coach, man. I mean, I didn't. Some of the people he coached, I didn't even realize he coached them. And then I remember the 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 one that really stuck sticks out to me though is he was the head coach for that Minnesota Vikings team. Who arguably had the greatest offense? One of the best offenses, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you had Randy Moss in his rookie season. That team went fifteen and one, and lost yeah, to Atlanta Falcons. And, and then you know this was a team that was supposed to go. Everybody thought was going to the Super Bowl that year because you had Chris Carter, you had Randy Moss, um, and then they just weren't. Uh, and Dante Culpepper as your quarterback. Um, I mean, Randall they, Cunningham. Yeah. Randall Cunningham. I'm sorry, and um, and they just weren't able to to get over that that hump in that game because of the missed field goals. I mean, you talk about a devastating loss, man, in a conference championship. Hurts, and man. you know that was a and you know that was a team that ought, that really could have won the Super Bowl. They could have yeah, they could have won because they they would have faced the uh, Denver Broncos. That's how, the matchup people wanted to see. How detrimental are 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 field goals in Minnesota? They oh, gave boy. Seattle oh, life oh, last year. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Look what that yeah, was. Who so was that? Okay. Morton Anderson that missed that kick back then. And the thing is, both and Minnesota. both kickers who missed yes. who missed uh, field goals. Their their record for missing was like superb. Like it yeah, was, they were great. They were great kickers. It, it like, just when it came down you to had it, one they one job at that one moment. And it, and it, and it, well, Bill Blair Walsh was a chip shot. I don't remember yeah. how long Anderson's was, Anderson's but Anderson's wasn't that. Uh, Anderson's was, was the, it was something that was well within I, his it, range. It was, it was like in his range. A, I think it was, it was a thirty, a thirty or maybe a forty. That has to that has to be tough. 
and I'm gonna let you get your point too. That had to be so tough to walk across the field, to, to to get all that yardage as an offensive as an offensive line to just get you in that spot. The waist. And then you go sit on the sideline like we got it, and he ain't got it. Mm. Mm. This this <laughs> this ball should hook a little to the left. That just sucks. Dang dog. I mean, I mean, at that point, that's that's why I said you need the cooling aspect because I know some people have talked about hurting their their kicker for oh, something. Oh, I know. Like oh, it's that. dangerous. It's dangerous. They should have a separate locker room for the kicker if you miss. <laughs> 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 but uh, but then Dennis Green was one one thirteen and ninety four um, as a record as a coach, and he actually does have a Super Bowl. But he was the wide receivers coach for the for the San Francisco Forty Nine ers and uh, I believe that was eighty eight. Not as a head coach. No, not as a head coach. He was an assistant. At least as a head coach, at least he could have gotten a shot. I mean, that that's one of those matchups where we won't see it, but it, it would have been so nice to see oh, would have been great. that offense oh, against great. John Elway's offense. Like that, oh, my gosh. Can you just imagine that, the, the possibility? I mean, remember, too, um, Dennis Green mentored Brian Billick. Came here and won the championship for the Ravens, so it's kind of a, a connection there between the two. Mm-hmm. Anywho, Randy Moss. I've been reading a lot of comments and positive things people are saying about him, and they are very true. He meant a lot to me and meant a lot to others. His legacy will live on. Coach Green gave me a chance. He sure did drafted the young boy that coined Mostham, or we coined Mostham after Randy Moss. There you go. Rest in peace to Dennis Green. And with seeing Dennis Green being gone, it's we kind of sort of have to tackle the 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 – minority port in the NFL to a degree. Dennis Green, guys like Tony Dungy. Not everybody could be Mike Tomlin, who's gone, exceeded every expectation as a as a black coach. Rooney Rule. If you don't know what the Rooney Rule is, it's an NFL policy that requires league teams to interview minority candidates for the head coaching job and senior football operations jobs. So basically, when everything goes kaputs in January – and everybody gets to hire the fi- the the laying off and the firing and the slicing and the dicing, as Martin Payne would say. Well, his mo- yeah, he would say about his mother who sliced and diced him. Um, they have to at least look at one. But when you look at one, Cravante, most of these coaches, and Tony Dungy alluding to that earlier this week, I don't even know if I'm going to get the job. I'm just going to go. Um, Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really weird how, how that's set up. Because what I've noticed with NFL teams is that they know, or if they don't absolutely know, they have a good idea who their next candidate is going to be. But they have to satisfy this rule. So they'll just interview uh, somebody who recently got fired or a big name just to solidify this rule. And I don't like it. My problem is required. It, it, it's literally, oh, hey, hey you, 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 yeah. that, that. Uh, Come, Come on over there. Right, right, right. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, they did we, that we with Todd you, Bowles. We, we but sit he you didn't down. Get the job. We sit you down for a couple minutes, and then it's like, okay, we fulfilled our, our quota. Our book. Yeah, and then you know, on to the next. <laughs> on, on to the next. Him. On with on him. To the next I one. wish Byron was here but to see that. I don't. I, I don't. I'm not a fan of it either, Cravante, because I understand the fact that we have to be able to to actually give these guys a shot. But is it really? Is it really a shot? Is what the the root of the question is because we're not giving I don't think a fair opportunity to people. You can call it fair and sugarcoat it because of the fact that they have an opportunity to be interviewed. But are you really legitimately giving this man a shot at this job when you already know who you want to be your next head coach? I read an article today and a coach. They didn't name the coach, but he did say. I knew I wasn't getting the job. Everyone knew it. Wow. I, and I know, wow. I, you you know that. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? That's nothing new. So why take the interview, though, is the thing. But, but they I mean, but, ask themselves well, whether to do it or not. Well, well, there are some guys who are getting more opportunities than before. I mean, it's only, it ain't, it's only but, but a handful of. It it's only, only a handful of. It was Hugh Jackson. That's it. In Cleveland. Right. And it's only, it's only a handful of uh, guys that's getting these jobs. But who did Hugh Jackson come from? He came from under Marvin Lewis, exactly. another minority coach. So, I mean, it's helping a little bit, but I just don't, don't like the fact that it's required because you're going to do the very minimum to for to satisfy that requirement, right? right. I mean, what happened with Todd Bowles? Um, 
hey man, Todd Bowles was a was a great <laughs> was a great defensive yeah. mind, and he New York got a chance with the Jets. And, and I guess I guess New York, well, New York is not really an attractive place. Well, at least the Jets, Jets organization are, is not yeah. really an attractive place to go. But Todd Bowles was up for a head coaching job, so it's like ah, let's take a, let's take a shot on him. I guess I guess they didn't have a quote unquote go to guy, and, and he's doing a phenomenal. Yes, he job is. Yes, he is. Line. I was ecstatic. I was ecstatic I mean, when he got a head coaching because, job. Because, I mean, this is a team that a lot of us didn't expect to go anywhere, and they were really close to making the playoffs. So, I mean, this is a team that's definitely what? going to be on the up and up. And they were able to acquire Brandon Marshall. Which which is huge. And that's already a defensive mind. And the Jets have been known for their defense. Mm-hmm. We, um, sit, we all are Morgan State grads. Our coach, our ex-head coach, He's became the, the wide receiver head receiver coach, coach for the Indianapolis Colts. How right. far up can you go from there? That's big. You come from an HBCU, you go to that environment. Hey, that, that, that's huge, man. He made it. Yeah. It's like he, he yeah. almost made it, but it's all about progression. He got to keep going. He can't stop there. But now, at this point, being a wide receiver coach, you got to have a big name to come out from under you. You got to have a big name, and then you move up. You know what I'm saying? That, that's the next thing. Yeah. He has to he mold has to somebody. somebody. And, and speaking of that, that, that alludes back to when we were talking about Dennis Green and what helped out with uh, Brian Billick right. because he had Randy Moss. So got to got, mold somebody. Got to have a big name. He's got to do well. You know what I'm saying? And then he's like, wow, he came from there. Well, I was going to mention the, another one. The coordinator spot is very thin for minorities, and that's what we need to get up. Once we get that up, People can get looked at and be a head coach. Oh, yeah, so it's only one step. I'm going to stay with you, um, um, D. Not to make this guy the poster child of the black coach, but at this point he is in this generation outside of Tony Dungy, who's perfectly fine with not coming to becoming a coach again. He's fine with his retirement. But Mike Tomlin. Mike Tomlin has exceeded every expectation. Not only has he – I mean, look what he's been able to do to the Pittsburgh Steelers organization – there's a long time coming before they're saying it's time for them to cut ways with him. Mike Tomlin. Yeah, you know, you don't you don't see too many coordinators with him though, African Americans like that. Is that his fault? Or is that because there's not enough to to, 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 to might reach be, from? It might be more is not enough to reach none. Reach from, excuse me. I mean it's kinda I'm not a big fan of uh what's the coordinator? Charles Haley. Uh he had his chance. <laughs> yeah. I, think, no, I think I think Todd Haley with the Steelers is actually doing a, a better He's doing job. A decent job. Because at first I mm-hmm. I was with you where I thought it was a questionable decision because him and the quarterback weren't getting along. And you know when your quarterback and your offensive coordinator aren't getting along, you're not going to be productive at all. But they've been able to add some pieces to be able to at least have that relationship be smoothed out now. Um Le'Veon Bell, we'll, we'll see what happens oh, with him. Oh, uh, hopefully, I mean, hey, that's another hey. show. We're not going to do it. Ho- hey, hopefully. the Redskins play him first. We're good. Ho- hopefully, <laughs> I mean, hopefully they get Yeah, we that. like that. But, I mean, How you if, like if, anything, that? if anything, with with what we're talking about in this particular segment, these guys <laughs> should know that there's not too many black head coaches out here. So you would at least not be selfish enough to do some of the things that you're doing. Yeah, don't be stupid. And, and uh, you know, put yourself in a position to help this man win and that you're thinking about other African-American head coaches. Because, I mean, this this is the best guy that we have in the league. We're talking about uh, black head coaches, but Mike Tomlin has far surpassed anybody else, and he has the respect of his, his, uh, his peers and is one of the best coaches in the league, not just as a black man, but one of the best coaches, period, sure in is. the league. Let's talk about rules as far as coaches. Mike Tomlin steps on the field, massacred. But a guy like, say, Bill Belichick does it. Mm-hmm. Well, Bill Belichick, I mean, is that really a good comparison? Only because, I mean, we talk about the Patriots organization and we think about the Patriots as cheaters. <laughs> with, with, okay, with, find somebody else. With, Mike Tomlin. With, with, Mike, with Mike Tomlin, I mean, when I think about Mike Tomlin, what you're saying, it reminds me of when he stuck his foot out during the That's Ravens game. About. Of course, but, of course. But, and, but it was funny, and though. Everybody's but, laughing. But, but you know what? It wasn't that bad. But and, and, he and, really and didn't thing, get screwed like thing, that. And the thing was, everybody laughed. Off, laughed yeah, we got to laugh it off. Even and the sh- Ravens laughed it off. And, and it, shout out to Rivera, too, our Spanish brother that holding down Carolina. Of course. And he's a part of minority crew, too. Shout out to him. Absolutely. On the other side of this break, 
I step aside. We welcome in Wayne Allen. And WWE is all yours for the taking. Dre, you and the hot seat, brother. This is the Flex Zone. We'll be right back. Woo! Welcome back, y'all. This is the wrestling portion of our show. Thank you, Mikel, for giving me the chair. This is your boy, Dre and D. And we got a special guest with us right now. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. The real Dwayne Allen has graced your presence once again on the Flex Zone. I appreciate you fellas for once again bringing me back on to the Flex Zone for this special wrestling segment. After a number of things have gone down in the world of professional wrestling, Let's get to it, gentlemen. That's I, right. I, I feel like we're, Let's get we're, ready to rumble. We're, we're missing somebody, though. What are you talking about? Your, your partner's missing. Y- you know what? Yeah. Um, my cat uh, usually ac- accompanies me to the studio when I do wrestling segments, but my my uh, my, my kitten... Wait, I don't, I don't have a cat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, wait. Uh, no, we don't have the Brian H. Waters. Yes. That's, I knew, so, I knew somebody was missing, but I was not paying attention because I swear I thought my cat was supposed to... Like, I, I, it's, I've changed the routine of what I feed my cat, so... Yeah. But yes, Brian H. Water is absent, surprisingly. Yeah. But I mean, you know, he had to he had to handle some some family right. issues. But just like big big Cass, when he didn't have Enzo, I, I, think, you, I think you got it. Oh I think yeah, you yeah, yeah. Got we, it. we we we've done some more than one occasion. This isn't my first rodeo. I think I could fill in, represent the wrestling realm the proper way. Right. So I'll do my brother proud, and hopefully the wrestling realm will be acknowledged once again and invited back to the show. By the way, oh no doubt, oh no doubt, man. Give him the big boot, man. <laughs> well. We're going to hop right into it. We we did a, a mock draft here, me, myself, and D. Um, I did SmackDown, and D took Raw. That's right. And, Dwayne, you were there when recording this this uh, video that we did, which y'all can find on Fox Sports 1340's AM YouTube page. And who had the better draft between myself and D? See, we, we had this discussion. I was uh, I was there when this was um, being recorded, and uh, I definitely kept tabs on not only the draft, which you guys drafted to each show, but the reason as to why you drafted to each show. When it was all said and done, um, I think I, I'll stand by my statement, what I said. I think, Dre, you would have taken a cake, but I think you were missing a piece or two. I will... I don't think I can forgive you for choosing the Undertaker, a part timer at second, <laughs> which everybody knows that Andre is very biased when it comes to the Undertaker. But like I told you, if you had picked Seth Rollins at number two, you still could have got the Undertaker at the end of the day. And but and I think that was probably the missing piece that you probably needed um, to put you over the top because of the new matchups that you had. But Raw, I mean, they just had all the money makers. I mean, I mean I- do you have what Cena and Orton and, and- Charlotte and? Yeah. Yep, and um, AJ Styles in the club. And Rollins, did you wait? You had AJ Styles on the, on it. The, see, that's that's what I'm yeah, talking about. Like he, he he beat me to uh, to AJ's house, but I mean, I had a few money makers myself with the Wyatt family, Kevin Owens, Dean Ambrose, absolutely, The um, Undertaker, Brock Lesnar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely had some 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 big names on there. Um, definitely some, some money makers. And I said the the most thing that appealed to me the best in regards to your your selections, like I said, you would have given me all new matchups, which is what I was looking for. If you at least probably got, like I said, I think you were missing at least two or three people. And I think the three people that I mentioned was at least AJ Styles, um, Sami Zayn, and and Seth Rollins. Yeah, even if it's one or two of those guys, even with like a um, like a Sami Zayn, um, right. what, he, what he's proven over time, I, I don't think he's ever had a bad big time match. Every major match he's had, he has exploded onto the scene. And I think anything you have with Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn on the same roster, I mean, it, when all those fails, you can always put them in in the ring and, and they'll just create magic. But um. Yeah, I, th- I think I think D you you had a you had a more realistic solid roster. I mean, between the Golden Boys of yesteryear with Cena and Orton, and then not only Seth Rollins and AJ Styles. So well, you Finn had Balor too. You picked up Finn Balor too. Yeah. See, I don't remember. That's that's crazy. It's like yeah. so so it looked like when I look at your roster, he had the future stars of today, yesterday, and then tomorrow. Versus you, you had a lot of new superstars, but I feel like you didn't have a lot of anchors because, like I said, I think that Undertaker pick probably hurt you. In the long run, but at the same time, we, we 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 talked about different matches and different intrigues like Kevin Owens versus The Undertaker, things like that, and then Kevin Owens versus Brock Lesnar, which I was, which I was like, I, I don't know, man, we might be on to something. But, I mean, that was just my two cents in regards to the draft. It, it was definitely fun watching you guys pick, um, you know, do do a mock draft. A lot of people don't highlight these types of things, so I think it was pretty cool for you guys. Uh, well, it was funny with us. We had 30 picks. They did 30 on SmackDown Live, and 
And you guys, right. you guys didn't even know, right? Yeah, no, no. We, yeah. we, we did this without knowing a lot of the rules, such as the uh, NXT six call picks. Ups, yeah. yeah, and that's another thing because I remember when you picked who picked NXT first. Dre, you and, did, and, and D was kind of like, wait a second, I don't know if we can pick NXT, but since well, you know, you know, he made that phone call and said, all right, I'll allow it, and then a couple other guys got called up as well. Yeah, and because um, D, you picked up Samoa Joe. Somebody picked no, up. I, pick, I picked up Samoa Joe, he picked which, Samoa which, Joe which is another one which I thought was a big deal. That was a very very big deal, which I thought was pretty cool. But like I said, man, I, you, you guys clearly know your stuff to say that okay, it's been a while since we have a legitimate draft, right. and since it, it I, I don't remember much about it. Like not that I, I was like all that young, but it's just it's been a while. Um, since they've done such a major, big deal, organized draft setting. So I think O two 2 was the, the first was the one, last with, big with, one. The under, um, with Vince McMahon and Ric, Ric Flair. Flair. I mean, goodness and, gracious, uh, yeah. And, and look at that was, roster back then. And the first pick was The Rock. Right. They yeah. had The Rock, Austin, now that Undertaker, roster was, Hogan, that roster was loaded. Triple H, Brock Jericho, Lesnar, yeah. Yeah. Brock st- just came up. I mean, you, you, you could Man. fart man events and make money right. with who you <laughs> have in roster. Right. Versus this 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 set of this roster is it just it's an influx of a lot of young talent with a mix of um very few veterans but r- r- really good ones that have a lot to contribute like i said randy orton coming fresh off an injury hasn't really made his legitimate in-ring debut but has popped up again john cena is to me i mean the dude got injured for four months or so and then come back with more endorsements i don't am i tripping or do i see him on more commercials now than he ever was now he is hot He's, now he's he's supposed to be on the Teen Choice Awards hosting with Victoria Justice. Yeah. Yeah. He's on. He's making more TV show appearances. I'm like, why is he in hefty bag commercials? He's, I understand him burying people, but taking out the trash. <laughs> <down. laughs> he's doing a he's doing a great job. This is something we had brought up on our live broadcast when we had talked about the the appeal of wrestling being able to cross over. The mm-hmm. fact that John Cena was able to host the ESPYS, yeah. and now he's hosting the People's Choice Awards. People so he's seeing, got people choice awards too, right? Yeah, he's yeah. he's so. Would yeah. you think that he's able to do that? Yeah. Would you think that John Cena at this point in his career, which because it seems like he's sort of taking a backseat in regards to the wrestling aspect, did you ever imagine that at this point, almost ten, eleven, twelve years, and however long he's been there, that he will be making this much commercial transition at this point? Because he's not like he's not the focal point, right? No, he's not. He's not the champion. They've this the new era has been ushered in as we are witnessing as we speak. Can you like? Just when you think everybody's like, okay, finally John Cena's out of our hair, he's showing up in other areas, and I'm like, man, see, and, th- and this he's the reason why advertisers pay big money for those spots on, and you know, on on Monday Night Raw, and I guess soon to be SmackDown Live SmackDown because Live because the face that runs a place is bringing a commercial appeal that everyone, I don't care who it is, everyone knows who John Cena is. To me, that's Hogan like. It is. You know it's, what I mean? It's right there with Hogan. Brian, Brian H. of the wrestling realm, he always says that I think when it's all said and done, John Cena will go down as the greatest WWE superstar of all time, which I can't have, a, which I have a hard time disagreeing <laughs> with because he's, he he may not have shattered merchandise records like Austin and Hogan, but for for where professional wrestling is in regards to um, popularity and crossover appeal, I'm like, there's no one else that even comes close or I can't even imagine like I can't I don't see anyone on the roster now of all these young amazing superstars that could even even match something like that almost 10 12 years from now I mean I'm glad that you had brought up the the John Cena aspect because this is something that when I was out this past weekend um on 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 this show we've been doing our top five series right and it's fun to have these debates with people outside the studio too when when we're promoting the show and yeah. this girl was saying that Shawn Michaels to her is the the greatest superstar of all time right and there was another right. guy who was there who jumped in the debate and he agreed and for me well we already know I'm biased towards the undertaker the dead man but this yeah. but it's a fun debate to have man, with your with your top five so this is a debate that we'll definitely have coming up with the WWE aspect. You can't be wrong. John Cena, I mean, his name does belong, at least in the conversation, because even years ago, you could see that John Cena was going to be the next guy. Right. Uh, I mean, some people say that it was kind of handed to him, but this this guy has worked for everything that he's gotten. And the fact that he's 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 a good looking guy, strong, and he's funny. When you when you hear yeah, other he's interviews he's done, I, um, I recently just went back through YouTube and was listening to an interview that he did on the uh, Howard Stern show mm-hmm. when he first won the championship. And it was a funny interview. 
and it was something that you just were intrigued and you kept wanting to listen to. And John Cena is a very open guy. He's funny, and we were able to see that when he hosted the ESPYs, and now that he's able to host another show, and we'll continue to see John Cena in other aspects. So I'm, I'm actually happy for not only John Cena, but the wrestling business as well, because it's something that a lot of the the older fans, we were turned away from some right. people because when the invasion came along, a lot of people had left mm-hmm. watching wrestling, and now you're starting to see those fans start to come back now with the new talent and the fact that you still have veterans such as a John Cena, Randy Orton, Brock Lesnar, Undertaker, who are still there to be able to guide the, these younger guys. So it's, it's a it's a great time in professional wrestling. Arguably, this could be the, the best time in professional wrestling because the wrestling has gotten a lot better too. Yeah, I would say the most marketable time because you can market yeah. the different areas. ESPN's got the segment now. You see Fox Sports, CBS Sports covering wrestling. You've never seen that. I mean, like even in the heyday, I mean, they're, they're everywhere. Yeah, and I think I think that's probably the, the best word for the the most marketing, you know, time for professional wrestling because like it, with popularity not being what it is, but yet at the same time, it because of its PG rating and because of the the content that they're putting out, you can market it to more than one audience, which is not an easy thing to do. You know what I mean? And um, I feel like that John Cena is probably the best ambassador yeah. for all of those areas, and and he doesn't have to carry the load, so. He may not be featured in the main event, but at the same time, like you said, because the wrestling itself, the product has changed in regards to the younger superstars and the guys coming up. It allows them to do that and appease the wrestling fans, but still keep advertisers and, you know, commercial audiences, you know, involved in the product in whatever way they, they decide to and do speaking so. Speaking of advertisers, we heard Vince McMahon and them got the big one last week, Toyota, sponsored the segment on SmackDown. That right? is ridiculous. Wow. They've never gotten a car dealer or maker to ever uh, – Hit anything on wrestling, so I mean, is PG paying off? I mean, I mean, uh, you think about it. Is every time something changes in wrestling, we're wrestling fans. We know we've seen it almost everything. Just about, probably with the exception of we we came in the back end of the golden era of the the eighties, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, we we've when it happens at first, we don't like it, and then we adjust to it, and then we eventually it pays off in the long run. And a lot of people credit Vincent McMahon for being a visionary because he sees things ahead of time, like. For instance, the WWE Network, when they decided to cancel the TV style of the the, the actual television network uh, format of doing the WWE Network and decided to go to an online thing, online streaming service, people thought it was crazy because it didn't make any sense. So, but in other words, but he still put the put the work in. He worked with the MLB Network to understanding the the, the, the concept of this uh, this this wrestling version of Netflix, and all of a sudden. At first, it struggled, but then once they made the expansion and it became global, all of a sudden, it's breaking records. Yeah. You know what I mean? Can we say the same thing about PG? I mean, we've criticized it so much because we were used to something that actually worked. And it's easy for us to say, well, shoot, go back to what works. Versus uh, uh, the captain of the ship saying, well, shoot, we got to transition to something else because, one, it's not as popular as it used to be. Two, right now the money is coming from the kids and the parents that are spending money on their kids and now we're seeing the commercial crossover pit. I'm like, well, shoot, maybe they wanted something that we just didn't realize 10 or 15 right. years ago. Yeah. Now, I mean, now, and I'm glad you, you're bringing all these points up. One one thing about the PG era, and John Cena has been the face of it, however, a lot of us have wanted him to turn heel or change his character. Do you think overall it's worked best for John Cena to stay who he is and true to himself? And I mean, not actually ever. He He has yet to ever turn heel outside of when he first debuted in WWE. He's been true to himself and had the same theme song. He comes out with the same shorts, does the salute. I mean... The G.I. Joe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess so. I mean, because think about it. I mean, he, would he really be in those hefty commercials? Would he really be hosting the Epis, uh, the ESPYs and People's Choice Awards and Teen Choice Awards and he's showing up at the, the Kids' Choice Awards when, you know, and the Nickelodeon stuff? It's like... When you look at the fruit of his labor, you're like, well, when you see the commercial success he's having and, and he's bringing to the company, I mean, he's turning him here really the smart thing to do. And he's still relatively yeah. young. Let's let's not forget that Hogan, when he turned heel, they really had no choice. They had literally done everything they could with Hogan. And Jimmy Hart said, man, listen, we were getting booed out of the arenas. At this point, nobody was cheering for Hogan. That's, That's the true. only reason he turned heel. Hogan never wanted to turn heel. He made a cloud. I'm Hogan. I can't turn heel. That's impossible. But he, after a while, you're like, listen, he was old. It's not like he was still in his prime. John Cena, he still go. I, I, he, I don't see any signs of him slowing down unless he chooses to, right? 
there's no reason for him at this point when there's people still cheering for him. He he goes away four months at a time and people still cheering for him. Yeah. Kids still love him. There was a point in time where the biggest baby face in the face of the planet, and Hogan, where nobody was cheering because those same kids that grew up with him, that, that grew up and that came up, became teenagers in that MTV generation. It was a very rebellious time for for the world, for the country, and he had no choice but to turn, and it just happened to work out in W.O. style. Cena, I don't see nothing like that happen. If you don't like him, okay, so what? But there's still a rather large segment that does like him. You know what I mean? It's not like Hogan was still getting endorsements. And, oh, yeah, he's still getting endorsements, so we can't turn him here. He, he literally had run like that. Hogan had really ran out. You know, he told me Hogan was running wild. It, Hulkamania had really ran out, and there was nothing <laughs> else you can do with it. He's not making any money anymore. You know, I'm sure fans are coming to see him for nostalgia reasons, but it was like there was literally nothing else left. Seeing it so much stuff, because he started to work with young guys. Hogan was stuck in his ways. That's Hogan true. always wanted to be that on top. That is the main difference, man. He only yeah. picked he picked guys that he either knew that's or or, or was aware of. Cena Cena was smart by when he got that United States Championship by going, I want to work with the young cats because I want to see fresh matchups. Because and then when he noticed that they were letting them put on legitimate matches, he right. wasn't burying everybody. And that's the difference between him and a guy like Hogan at the end of the day. And I think he reinvented himself in a lot of and you know a lot of us older fans who are tougher on guys like John Cena said, okay, I kind of respect that because he's getting in the ring with your Neville's. He's getting in the ring with your Sami Zayn's and in Kevin Owens. I mean, goodness gracious! My goodness, and AJ Styles now, but it started AJ, back. Yeah, come on, man. With, with Daniel he, Bryan, though, man, when he got in the ring, Daniel Bryan, he gave him. He pretty much and he he, he was also able to, he was also able to put people over too. Right, and that's and I think that shocked people, I, because I think it showed people enough for all, all the smarts that are like, oh yeah, he's willing to do business. Hogan wasn't that necessarily that guy. Oh, he was like, God. I don't think this is like he barely wanted to drop the title of Sting at Starcade. He didn't think that was a good idea. You know what I mean? Like that they, was, they, they <laughs> paid off almost two years to that angle. And that's what I'm trying to say. After two years <laughs> of not seeing Christ. Sting, I think Sting, I didn't wrestle for like 190 days, some outrageous number like that. And even then, Hogan was like, I'm just not sure this is the right thing to do. And and that's probably one of the most iconic moments in in professional wrestling history, especially Sting in WCW history. And that's something that almost didn't happen because of somebody's opinion. Cena never had that attitude. He 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 he's a best for business kind of guy. So I mean, listen, they got the right ambassador for 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 the WWE brand. Uh, since we're, we're, we're running out of time here, I want to quickly get into Battleground. That's uh, something that m- myself and D, we were there live. Yes, and was. Dwayne, you said you saw it on the, the WWE Network, which yes, you sir. did for nine ninety nine. Nine ninety nine. It's just fun to say that, y'all. <laughs> um, some of the matches that we had were. Um, Br- Breezango? How do you say this? Ta- yes, this new Breezango tag? and what? The, the old nose, as I like to call them. I mean, the Usos, I'm sorry. Uh, wow, really? The old nose? That's what you call them? That's, that's what their career are right now. Oh, no. Because he's saying that their their character is getting stale right now. It is do you getting agree? stale. Absolutely. They not, they, listen, how many times have they been on? How many pre shows have they been on and they've done the same thing every pre show? <laughs> yes. You talking Usos. about the intro? No, the? just it, the same thing. They're going to they're gonna do the intro, they're going to come out, they're going to smile, they're going to dance, they're going to do the same moves. Come on, drop. And they're going to do the same. It's, it's the same match every every pre show. And then it's over, and then they dance in the ring again, and they get dressed and wait for everybody else to have the rest of the show. So, what do the Usos need to do? Turn heel, amen. With with Roman Reigns, they have nothing else to lose. Samoan Dynasty. Bad part is now they both on separate shows now. The Usos on SmackDown and Reigns on Raw. Well, well, hopefully, with the brand split, they'll SmackDown will sort of just sort of dig because right tag team wrestling has been in a sort of a standstill because they're trying to reintroduce new tag teams. So, I, I get that, you know what I mean, but um. I think they just either either they got to – I mean, they don't necessarily have to turn here, but to me it made it made them interesting when I saw them team up with Roman Reigns to take on um, – The club? Yeah, to take on the club because to me they, they were a little bit more edgier. They were like, we're not really going to play by the rules. We're not the smiling face. Like, nah, this is my people. And it was like gang warfare. I took offense to you coming at my family. So it was like I, I like the edgier, you know, the brothers having each other's back exactly. and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, they, they, they just got to get into the mix. I like the Usos. Have they addressed the tag team situation in regards to the brand, the brand split and the we titles? Haven't, we haven't heard much from um, the tag team, man. We know on Raw this week they, they're they going to introduce the WWE Universal Championship. Okay. So, yeah, And that's going to be the new not, world title. That is going to be interesting with the, the title situation moving forward with uh, the women's championship as well as the tag team championship. I'm kind of curious to see what's going to happen. I want to see what's going to happen with the WWE Championship with uh, – Dean Ambrose, who are you going to put him with? Is it going to be Bray Wyatt? Can you throw Kane? I guess Kane gets a title shot every year, right? I guess. Uh, well, Kane at him. Uh, Kane Dolph Ziggler, Kane perhaps? deserves a title shot. Kane deserves one one run. You I mean say. with the title? Yeah, with, with the title. And no, I think stop he, it. 
So come on, I can't quite go that far. Yeah, I agree. I, I think he, he's been in every title picture ever since. Somebody like these with Daniel Bryan, he was in title picture. That's what I'm saying. Right? Every Rollins. year he at least get one title. But I'm saying, can shot. he win it at least one more time? He, he had it when he won the World Heavyweight Championship against Edge. Remember when Edge was when Paul Bear came back for for yeah. a short time? That was his. To me, that was his last title run. Yeah, so sad what happened with his career. Well, we had uh, last night. Well, at Battleground, we had Sasha Banks. And Bailey team up against Charlotte and Dana Brooke. Uh, th- I think that was huge for it was Bailey huge. To- uh, well, I heard with Bailey's a one off, so she's gonna go back down to NXT and fight Asuka at um, Battleground Brooklyn. Is that a, is that a curtain call? Maybe, maybe because I, mean, I remember Sami Zayn had a curtain call against uh, he did. Shinsuke Nakamura. He did, and that was his last run. And then, and then uh, Finn Balor had his. At his curtain Last call. His curtain call with Shinsuke Maybe as well. Nakamura. Yeah, right. So, to me, sort of passed the torch, if you ask me. Um, so do we see the same thing with Bailey, or is she sticking around in NXT for a little bit? No, I think it's time for some of these people to come I would love to, to see up, come up. Especially because the ovation that she was able to get, and people were just excited to see her. And this is somebody who, not only we're, when we're talking about the Divas Revolution, we're talking about people such as Charlotte, Sasha Banks, Becky Lynch. This is another woman who can come in there and really make a – a huge impact, and you're seeing that fans are really behind these. Oh, women. fans are behind her. Yeah, easy. It, it, even the look on Sasha Banks' face when she saw the reaction that 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 Bailey got, she looked over to, and she just like she looked around, just sort of shook her head and started laughing, like wow, like she, it was almost, it was almost like, see, I knew that was going to happen as soon as she got up here. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. And yeah. Sasha won the woman's title on Raw, so, uh, so that's going to be some good business. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you know, I love me some Sasha Banks. Don't I, I would have waited for SummerSlam a little bit, but. Hey, I mean, better late than never, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, and, and, and that's that's just sometimes. I know Raw is the premier show, but sometimes moments like that, I just wish we would save some of these for the pay-per-view. I understand that you want to make that splash, but a moment like Sasha winning the belt, the Usos when they finally won the tag team titles, I mean, these are moments that you just don't want on Raw. You want these moments on you want these moments on uh, on the on the pay per view. Sometimes yeah. some things like because it reminds me of that nitro effect. I was about to say, yo yo we yo we just <laughs> talked about this too sweet. I was too like yo that, that reminds me of that WCW Monday Nitro stuff where they were just they were putting on. I'm telling you man, some of that stuff I've seen some of the, some of the best matches in like pay per view caliber type things I've seen on Monday Nitro main event cards. And I was, it's <laughs> I mean it's I don't know at at this point it's like I don't know what they have up their sleeves so. I'm, Speaking of uh, those good matchups, some people saying that this may be the matchup of the year. Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. Easy. I promise you. Every time. I can, listen, I can watch that. I can watch them go at it every day, 365 days a year. You know what's crazy about this particular rivalry? Like, we, we've seen rivalries in the past, and they get a little stale, but this is a rivalry that we, every time they're in the, in the ring, is just epic. I, I, I kind of reminds you of Tommy Dream and Raven in ECW. Yeah. Only difference is, you know, Tommy didn't beat Raven for what, almost two years. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. And then Raven left for WCW, came back, and then they tagged together. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, Sami Zayn and, and, and Kevin Owens. I mean, it's chemistry. It's just, it, it, I, I was expecting to see it at, I don't know what, Mania or something like that. I think I, I, I wanted to see a ladder match at Mania, but I guess I was moving too fast. No, no, I don't, um, I don't think you were. Um, and I think that's that's the move that they should have made, but maybe they're saving it for later on down the road. And that's why I didn't trip. I said it's still early. I said Sami Zayn's just getting reacclimated to the main roster after that injury, man. But these guys, the, 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 the chemistry between them two is unbelievable. It's off the charts. They, If, if you watch their stuff as, as Kevin Cena and El Generico, they've done some – They've had some very vicious matches and, and promotions all around the world. And uh, I, was, I was telling Brian H. this the, maybe last night, I think, as a matter of fact, after the pay-per-view, and I said, I said these guys are probably the only two guys, with the exception of um, Nakamura as well, that can have these full-throttle, intense matches, and yet they take care of each other so well in the ring. I mean, it's intense, it's vicious, and then the psychology of everything that they do, I mean, the chemistry is there. Like, that's, they're going to be fighting each other all the way up to world title, to world title. Like, I can see them fighting for a world. For, I can see Kevin Owens dropping the title to Sami Zayn, the, the, either the WWE Championship or the WWE Universal Heavyweight Championship, as we know now, at some point in their careers later on down the line. Because I'm like, man, these, some things just don't. Get old. They can literally do this for, because it seems like no matter how many times they tell the story, they they tell a different chapter, and that's not everyone can do that. 
Not everyone can can do can say, okay, we're going to take the story and tell you a different chapter of it every single time. Versus with AJ Styles and Roman Reigns, we can only see that but so many times. Seth Rollins versus Roman Reigns, we can only see that. And they, and they, and both matches, both feuds had history versus, but this they go back way too deep. And it seems like they tell the same story, but yet it's different. That's that's what we know when you're a professional when you can oh, say, great. okay, I can take this one concept and I could just keep twirling around to something different every time. That's that's genius. I think that's that's a mark of excellence between the both of them. At, at, it gets you on the next level. I mean, cut you off. Oh, no, you could. Get you on the next level. You know, you had, the, what, 25 robberies that came out that DVD yeah. a couple of years ago? You can put this robbery on that DVD. I mean, oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, when I, I'm telling you, is like... Tommy it, Raven, is it Tommy Dreamer Raven 2006? I'm seeing, I'm seeing Hogan Savage between these two. Yes. I'm talking like their, their careers are literally far like they, they've grown up with each other in the business and I th- like I said I think you're going to see this all the way up until their world title days when, when they're the main eventers oh my goodness um, I mean I, I have the smile on my face because Finn Balor Seth Rollins for the WWE Universal title I haven't been shocked in wrestling in a long time they're, but they're, that got me Monday night this new era they're, that, they're that giving it to me. us man that got me I, w- I was going to say the other um matchup that the only other rivalry I can think of that even comes close to a rivalry that we love to see and we we don't get sick of it is Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. That's another one. Yeah. That, yeah, that, Ooh, that, those two when they got throw Roman Reigns in it too. Is my is it no, stop it, I, I, stop I it, Dean. Come on now. No, he's not I, invited to this party. I know. Well, <laughs> he's not invited to the title party at SummerSlam. We know that. Oh. But. <laughs> he, this, this, this is why I edited the video the way I did. Like I'd be saying something else right now, but I'm sure we have FCC laws we have to abide by. <laughs> but but that that triple threat between them is no, D. D. No, Dre tell him no. Every yeah, time it, Dean yeah. Ambrose and Seth Rollins go at it, it's I, the same. Oh, I love it's them the same too. Thing. Don't get me I, wrong. I understand the fact that those three are tied together because they are of the tied Shield together. We can't and the that. faction that the, that they were able to do because the Shield made an impact on wrestling that we haven't seen in quite some time. Yeah. However, when we talk about people who grew up in the business together. Is something just special every time you see Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose, I and agree. it's a rivalry, it's a matchup that you just don't get sick of seeing. We had, and and you can tell this is a special rivalry when you put this as a main event on Raw, and then they did the same thing again on SmackDown, and you're st- you're watching every bit of the matchup. That's, hey, that's true. That's, that's it's true. special. I can't it's, deny and that. Not, ev- not everybody has those those moments. You know what I mean? Like I said, when 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 we first saw um, Seth Rollins and and um, Dean Ambrose, first of all, that was to me that was the sign of the new era. The very very very, I mean, the smallest seed of inkling of this is the new era. We, the first thing we kept thinking about, man, this 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 might be Cena Orton. They might be able to do this for for a good ten years if they need to. Yeah. And to me, it's so good they had to keep going away from it because they're going to steal everything every single time. So I agree with Zane and Owens. Have a little reprieve. Come back to it. And, and, and it to doesn't it. match. That's the, that's the crazy part. It does not matter how many times you go away from it. You can always come back to it because they have enough reason to do it. Right. They have so much history, and it's just like, man, no and, matter. And we know also now Brock Lesnar be on Raw next Monday night. Oh. So oh, they, no. they might uh, address some of these yeah. issues. Now, that's going I would, on. now, I just wish he would have been at Battleground before. Or at least Heyman. At least Heyman. At least somebody. But, um, I mean, it's yeah. Hamza, you got to cut him a check first if he does anything. Yeah, you ain't lying about that. I don't care how good the story is. But but Smart I do hear he will be at SummerSlam. If he's not yeah. under contract, oh, he's, he's going to be. At he's going to be at SummerSlam. Now, yeah. now, before we wrap up, I just want to ask your thoughts real quickly on Enzo and Amara, um, Enzo Amara and Big, uh, Big Cass teaming up with John Cena against the club. I thought it was an excellent, an excellent opportunity for Enzo and Cass to, um, to me, uh, one, get – get that maven spotted because to me they're the tag team of the future i don't mean like they're the greatest tag team but they they're the ones that you can to me that they're like edging christian they're entertaining uh, and i noticed that from nxt them being paired with john cena at the height of his popularity it don't there's a natural association between the popularity of john cena versus how serious they really want in doing cast to really take off as a tag team and for them to be i mean they were the probably the greenest guys in the ring I mean, you got a veteran tag team and 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 Luke Gallows and and Carl Anderson who traveled the world. You got a veteran and and a and a breaking superstar in AJ Styles, which is crazy at this point in his career. And then you got the face that runs the place. And for those, if, and they shined in that match. Big I time. mean, they started the match with doing what they did. It was funny. It was on edge. I mean, they had DC Rock, and I'm like, man, I think those guys got the ultimate rub being in the match with all. Five of those guys, and um, I, I mean, I, I just I see big things for Enzo and Cass. I think that's 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 the future of tag team wrestling in the WWE. 
And Cena didn't even get on the mic and say anything. He let him go. Yeah. And, I mean, he at the point, you, you see him dapping them up, and he was having fun with what they were saying yeah. in the ring. And like you said, it was to a point where John Cena didn't even have to open his mouth and say anything. It was it was literally fun. They made the atmosphere fun. And I could tell it was a changing of the gardens when you're there and you're seeing – a lot of shirts, a lot of people came in with the certified G shirts as well as the Seth Rollins shirts. So you see this transition with wrestling right now that's going on. But, y'all, this is our time right now, and I'm going to swing it back to Mikel Ramos. And Take with us that, WWE in a nutshell. Thank you, fellas. Dwayne, Allen, always a pleasure, my brother. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. Next week, just in case you didn't know, the Flex Zone. This was episode 99. We will be turning 100 years old. Kind of, sort of, sort of, kind of. But we'll be having our 100th episode. Something to celebrate. Cue applause. Yeah. 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 It won't One be like UFC big party in this place. Have yet to get a cake dedicated to what Dre's preferences are. Can I come? We're not going to talk about that. You're on the way. I'm invited to this You're invited. Too? Why right. won't you be? All shucks now. You're the man Uh-oh. that makes my left side looks good during these promos. Why wouldn't that? Well, all right. Anyways, all, right. all will be in attendance. Joining us will be, uh, if you guys remember Brittany, uh, the women, man, we're back. And Shane will be also. Who knows what other special pr- surprises that will bring for you. Make sure you still, um, if you want some more of this WWE fun, you go and check out the, our YouTube channel. Subscribe to that, The Flex Zone. And check out Dre and D on our WWE mock draft for special for WWE. And if you agree with the picks, let us know. Okay, the show's over. We want their true sounds for our theme song. Don't forget to like us on our Facebook page, The Flex Zone. Again, follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Flex Zone 1. If you have any questions, ideas, or possibly want to be a guest, send us an email to TheFlexZone1 at gmail.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Flex Zone. If you ever forgot, and I haven't said this whole show, and it's totally absurd of me, our home people, Fox Sports, 3040 AM. Don't forget that. Um, tonight's show is actively produced by Andre Melton. Our senior producer is Crevante Hurd, and our host is moi. Our production team is Sophia, Terrell, Bree, Dwayne, you're sitting here, Hugh Scott, Brian the H. The Waters. See y'all, you guys soon. And Tyron Rice in the back, handling our engineering everything, Mr. Engineer Extraordinaire himself. On behalf of the fellas, the show, it's over. I'm saying, like I said, every week, I don't care for rounds of minds. I'm Mikael, I come Mikael, and next week... 100. And Show's over, people. And like that, we gone. We gone. I always wanted to do that. We gone. We gone. <laughs> <laughs>